my name is Amy. Person is Catherine Gomez. We're interviewing Lieutenant Colonel Robert McClure today, March 24, 2005, at Rome Free Academy. It says cleaning cassette. Hmm? It says cleaning cassette. Could you please state your name and rank? My name is Robert W. McClurg. My rank is Lieutenant Colonel USMCR. Now, did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted. How did your family feel about this decision? My dad died when I was four years old. My mother, my brother, and my sister. I was the youngest of the three kids. But I started out in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and I ended up in uh, Syracuse, New York. And why did you choose the Marine Corps? I chose the Marine Corps because back in 1939, I was enlisted in the uh, Toon Leaders class in Quantico, Virginia. The two leaders class in Quantico, Virginia, if you went six weeks in your junior year, and six weeks in your senior year to the Marine Corps training, you would then come out as a Marine second lieutenant. But in the meantime, Pearl Harbor happened, and Pearl Harbor happened, then I was at college in my senior year, and in my senior year, I took flight training. I figured here's one course that maybe I can pass. <laughs> and do you feel your training adequately prepared you to fly during the war? Say that again. Do you feel that your training adequately prepared you to fly during the war? Oh, yeah. Now, actually, what happened, I got nine other guys to join the Navy Air Corps. They told us we wouldn't have to write our thesis, we wouldn't have to take our exams, we would just graduate. And that sounded all good to them, but these guys were football players and basketball players, and here's little me, had convinced them they should join with me. <laughs> well, the Lieutenant J.G. told me that he had to talk to the Dean of Men. When he came back to the campus two weeks later, he said, you're going to have to take your exams. I said, I'm dead. Why? I said, these guys said, you told me they wouldn't have to take their exams, they wouldn't have to write their thesis. They're going to kill me. They're twice of my size. So he said, well, get a hold of them. We'll go up to the grill and have a coat. I was going to Westminster College at that time. We went up there, and he said, don't worry about passing your exams. They're looking for pilots. They're looking for anybody to get in and help stem this war that's going to happen. So we went to Philadelphia Navy Yard as a unit of 10. I was the only one that turned out to be a Marine, and the rest turned out to be Navy. I got my Marine commission as I graduated from flight school, they got their Navy commission as ensign. I became a second lieutenant. Now, according to your book on Boynton's Wing, you took a ship from San Diego to Hawaii. What was this experience like being on the ship? Well, I checked into Hawaii. The colonel down there wanted to look at my logbook. He looked at it. He said, I don't know how you got here. I said, I almost almost said I came by boat. You don't say that to a Navy man. I said, I came by ship. He said, no. He said, you don't have enough hours to go anywhere. He said, before you leave this island, that's Hawaii, you'll get more training. Three days later, I was in New Caledonia. The orders had never been cut. Went from New Caledonia to uh, 
Buddha Fudi, uh, Espirito Santos, and from there in a pool in Espirito Santos. I was also on another island, Canton, and I think I told you, New Caledonia. Now, what was the weather like in these areas? The weather there was not bad at all, but the weather in the Pacific, very unpredictable, I found out later on. And I'm sure that affected your job as a pilot. Day say, day. Say, say that again, And please. I'm sure, how did that affect your job as a pilot? It affects you an awful lot because we had no working navigation boards in our Corsair. We had to do it all by dead reckoning. Dead reckoning is when you take with your compass and you aim in on something here. If I aim in on something here and I'm two degrees off, by the time you get 220 miles away, you're way off. <laughs> Um, now, what, where, were you, where, where were you when you first saw combat? Where were you from? Uh, first talking about Espirito Santos, and that's in the, in the New Hebrides. And I was there as a replacement pilot. But when they looked at my record, I only had 21 hours of fighter time. Most pilots were instructors or so forth. They come over with 125 hours. They had flown fighter planes. I only had 21 and a half hours. And that was in the Brewster Buffalo and that flew like a rock. <laughs> now what, what events do you remember from this day? What eventually what? What events do you remember from that first day of combat? Uh, the first, first real battle we get into, we had 30 Japs come down through us from a high cumulus cloud. They were trying to get at the dive bombers down below who were bombing their strip. And we ended up shooting down 12 of them, and they only shot down one of us, which made us feel real good. Now, how did you become part of the Black Sheep Squadron? I was put in a replacement pool, and Pappy said, before you do anything, you got to check out in the course there. So you sit in this course there for three days and learn where all the instruments are, and the lights, trim tabs, and everything else. And then I'll come down and I'll ask you a few questions. If you can answer those questions, you get airborne. There was another guy being checked out at the same time I was being checked out in a different course there sitting over somewhere else in a revetment. His name was Shorty. So he said, remember this airplane had a lot of torque? Means when you push that big throttle forward, that airplane wants to go to the right. We were in strips that were lined with palm trees, as you can see them right in that picture there. Don't dare get that Corsair into the palm trees or you'll die. I took off, off the stick, off the rudder, went up. Through. I took a few palm fronds with me, but I got up to 7,000 feet, did my stall landings, come in to land, and I bounced it. You weren't supposed to do one, but I kind of enjoyed it. Threw it to the firewall, get up, come around again, and landed. So Pappy come down in the Jeep. I said, how short do you do? He said, I'll talk about it later. He said, you enjoy that? I said, it was great. He said, you're a liar. <laughs> I didn't say anything more than that. I just waited for his next remark. He said, this airplane scared the holy Jesus out of me. I will tell you one thing. You fly like a big bag of air. What's an air? So I said, oh. He said, you're never going to get home. Now, I'm 8,000 miles from home. But my mama never told me that. 8,000 miles from home. There's only one way you're going to get home, kid. I have to teach you some fighter tactics. I have to teach you a lot of things. He said, you'll be my wingman for a while. My dad died, as I said before, when I was four years old. He took me under his wing and he taught me fighter tactics. He taught me a lot of things that I didn't know before. And as I said to other people this morning, there's three, re three reasons I'm here. 
God put me on this earth. The Corsair brought me through the Pacific. If it hadn't been for Pappy, I wouldn't be talking to you today because he taught me many things. Now, could you show us that picture and tell us about the people in it? Yeah, this picture is a picture of the squadron. There were 51 pilots to begin with. Today, there's 14 of us. That doesn't mean we all got killed in the Pacific. Some of us died in old age. Some of them must have got lost at sea. That's a big ocean. And the other thing is, if I had to do it over again, I would do it over again if I knew what's coming out with all my fingers and toes. This picture right here, this is Pappy. That's me sitting next to him. There are about, we had nine aces in our squadron. Now I'll tell you a story that happened. I gave you a picture showing the ball bats and the hats, and that was done because our intelligence officer sent away to St. Louis. They were the leading baseball team at that time. He's, they told they come back and said, we'll send you a ball bat for every ace in your squadron. We'll send you a St. Louis ball cap for everyone that shot down a Jap. Almost all of us had shot down a Jap. I was fortunate enough to get seven. The guy next to me got nine. Then we go over to Pappy. He got 26 or 28. This is later on. And then we go from him to our double ace, John Bolt, and he got he got six with us flying the course there, then went to Korea and flew the Phantom jet and shot down five MiGs. So he was a double ace. Now of those pilots, the only one in the front row that's left was me. Uh, this happens. Uh, I would say the answer to anything that is creating history, and this is part of history, and that's the most important thing. It isn't what we did. We were trained to do what we did. The most important thing is camaraderie between these pilots and each other. If we had a compass that didn't work, your wingman had one that worked. So you had to stay with your wingman. If you were going to get shot down or the engine caused trouble, they'd know where you went down if you had a wingman with you. It's a big ocean. That's why you camaraderie, staying with your, your uh, wingman or your flight leader. Now, I see the symbol of the black sheep on your hat. Can you tell us about that symbol? Yeah. This symbol, and I gave you one of these this morning, was done by, they were going to call the black sheep <coughs> Boynton's Bastards. Couldn't do that at that time because they don't print those words then, they print it now. So instead, we became black sheep. Notice that the crop, crop runs the wrong way, it should run the other way. We got 12 stars, one 13 stars. The course there is at the top of it. They became Boynton's Black Sheep Squadron. And what were you and the Black Sheep Squadron asked to do in your missions? Most of my missions had to be done by flying wing on Pappy Boynton or flying wing, whoever was your leader at that time. My job was to protect his tail. We protected each other's tails because we had 650 caliber machine guns. We protected each other's tails by turning inside each other. No Jap could come at you because you had wings to bear. No Jap could come at you from that side because you had, you had these guns pointing at them. So that was called the thatch weave, T-H-A-T-C-H. And we protected each other that way. Were you ever used to support field operations or Navy vessels? Uh, we protected the Navy vessels coming up the line. We were not exposed to the kamikaze that's later in the war. Uh, we had to protect our supply ships coming up the line. We had to patrol over them, shoot down belly bombers or any of other bombers that would 
be trying to sink these ships. And what was day-to-day -day life like when you weren't flying? Say that one more time. What was day-to-day -day life like when you weren't flying? Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't as bad as it sounds. Mm -hmm. I was a fisherman. I caught a lot of fish over there. Caught a 54-inch barracuda, 35-pound <laughs> red snappers. Uh, I used to gather oysters, put them in my sock, put it with powdered milk, and that made oyster stew. I collected shells. I made knives out of out of uh, uh, blades, put handles on them. So we enjoyed life, and I made a, a kayak, which was covered with airplane cloth. And I used to go out and collect, collect cat's eyes and make rings out of them mm -hmm. from Australian Florence. What areas in the South Pacific did you encounter the most Japanese resistance? The most Japanese resistance that we came against was really Rabaul, R-A-B-A-U-L. Rabaul was the second largest Japanese outpost other than Trump. It was Rabaul, Truck, and Japan. Do you feel that the American planes you guys flew <coughs> were better than the Japanese planes? Absolutely. The plane that we were flying, the Corsair, had armament behind your seat. It could climb faster than the Jap. It could dive faster than the Jap. We had purged wing tanks. We'd take off in our wing tanks when all the gas was out of it. There would be fumes in there from gasoline. We could press a button and a CO2 bottle would fill that thing with carbon dioxide and it would never ignite if you got shot at. We found out the best way to get the Japs, instead of our 650 caliber machine guns crossing at 800 yards, we had them cross at 440 yards. At 440 yards, those big Shells, the 50 calibers would cut a box car in two. We found out that if we took the armor placing ammunition out of our things, put more tracers in there, put more uh, shells that would cause the zero to burn when it got hit, we found out we could shoot them down quicker. So we did learn a lot by just participating in the battles. Did you ever meet the enemy outside of air combat? I met the enemy at air shows last year. <laughs> now I'm a little guy. They were a head shorter than I am. <laughs> My wife went out and met one of the women. They asked us to come forward. They had zeros parked out there. They had three zeros. And this Japanese lady said to my wife, I'm a Japanese fighter pilot's wife. And Julie, my wife, said to her, I'm an American fighter pilot's wife. And they hugged each other. They said, why well, couldn't it have been like this? No reason to do what we did. I'm against war 100%. If I had to do it over again for the experience, yes, I would. I don't believe our boys should be in Iraq. I think we're wasting humanity and I'm not for killing anybody. But I was a victim of circumstances and to keep your life going, I had to do what I did. Mm -hmm. um, while on a mission, did you have any close calls? Yes, I did. I had 81 missions. I had a close call three different times. I was up at 22,000 feet the engine cut out on me. I come down to 12,000 feet, got it going again, looked ahead of me and there were two Japs flying in formation. I thought, well, if this engine's going to keep acting up, I'm going to take a couple of boys with me. So I come up behind him, shot the wingman down, and he turned and blew up going this way. The other guy flew straight ahead, I thought, you got to be stupid and not to know where your wingman is. And I ate him up from behind and he blew up. 
That was a close call. The first close call I had was when I shot at the first zero. And I don't know if I've told you that story or not. We were on a mission. The first mission we were on, I saw these Japs come out of 30,000 feet in the air from the clouds. They were trying to get to the bombers. I see this guy turning his lights on and off. Now remember, we're in a dogfight, which you shouldn't do because they can turn inside and they could not dive you, they could not climb you. I saw him turn his lights on and off, but I looked. He wasn't turning his lights on and off. He's shooting 30 millimeter shells at me. And I'm flying in a skid, so he's putting them out here. I straightened it up as we came head on at each other. I blew him up just as he went by me. That was my first. The only other close deal is <coughs> I brought a plane back that was pretty well shot up. And I had to land it. I had to land it with one landing gear. The tire was flat on the other side. When I got finished landing it, I went up into a revetment and settled back down. I get up and I stood by the palm tree. As you might know what I was doing, scared to death. Pretty soon the mech come up. He said, sir, do you know how much oil you have in your plane? I said, no. He said, one cup. <laughs> That's calling it close. The other one was I had 231 caliber Japanese machine gun bullets come through my canopy, my hood, and as a result of it, as a result of it, it went out the other side. Now either I had my head turned, because we stretched cord from here to here, or else I had my seat all the way down. It would have taken me at the end of the $87,000 airplane and the $25,000 trainee that was in the airplane. <laughs> So, How many Japanese planes did the Black Sheep Squadron shoot down as a unit? We shot down over a hundred and some planes. Our division of four planes, Pappy Boynton shot down 28, Chris McGee shot down nine, I shot down seven, Don Moore shot down four. Of those four planes, I'm the last pilot that's still above ground. And did you shoot down any Japanese ships? Yes. We strafed many barges. In fact, is, I'll give you that information. That's why I have this here. And this is, this is true facts that I'm going to give you now. Fact is, I think what you should do, can you make a copy of this? Mm -hmm. That answers your question. Okay. <laughs> that tells you everything. Nice. Thank you. Now let me see the so second. I see, I'm seeing four ships that you have yeah, and you 20 do. barges. Yeah. Let me see the second page of that. Now was that information hard to get a hold of? Would this be hard to get a hold of? Mm -hmm. Some people don't have it. I kept all of my stuff together. And could you show us a copy of the book that you wrote with this information? Yes, this is the, the book that I wrote with my co-author. This is me as the author. Wait till I put these things in here. Mm -hmm. This is me as the author. Mm -hmm. You can read about me there. This is my co-author who was an engineer. It took us six and a half to seven years to write this book. And the book was written to straighten out the people that believed the Black Sheep show was rather strange, but it had to be done that way, and it had to be done that way because who is going to watch somebody taking off in the dark in a rainstorm? There's no romance in that. The only way you can make it romantic is to put some women in it, and the kids would watch it, and the women would watch it, and that's why I wrote this book. I straightened them all out. These are the facts from the Pentagon, which is the place that had all the information that no one could get a hold of during the war. These are the facts from our intelligence officers' reports. These are the facts from my 
a law book. Everything in here is true. There's many pictures in here. This law book, this book, an intelligence report will give you true facts of what the black sheep were all about. And before I leave here, I think you've got to take this picture because I'm going to answer your question this way. Two tours of duty. We shot 96 airplanes down. Third two the tour, we shot down 57. That's 153 total airplanes we shot down. 96 enemy planes were destroyed in aerial combat. And of those planes, 93 of them were over enemy territory. 34 enemy planes were probably destroyed in air combat. That means they didn't catch on fire. So you can't count them as a real kill. But they, they don't catch on fire, you can't count them. <clears throat> That's about uh, 50 enemy planes were damaged in aerial combat. Enemy planes destroyed on the ground. About 21, that's 201 airplanes. We shot up 100 foot AK uh, barge, a 50 foot AK a barge, a 70 foot Japanese operated Chinese junk destroyed, a 70 foot steam launch destroyed. 20 Japanese barges destroyed, three Japanese barges loaded with troops destroyed. That was something else. Uh, one raft loaded with enemy troops destroyed, 15 other craft probably destroyed, 123 Japanese bivouac areas, four Japanese uh, Airfields destroyed, Kahili, Kara, Balali, and Bratov. We intercepted and successfully broke up flights of Japanese fighter planes, bombers, and so forth who were trying to bomb our ships coming up the line. Now, I would suggest if you take the picture of this, just take the picture of the first page. The second page were people that died and so forth. We, uh, I had one, 81 missions that I went on. You know, when I come out of the Pacific, I'd flown 1,200 hours. But if you take that picture and then give it back to me, then you'll know the story. And how were all these kills kept track of? Say that again. How were all these kills kept track of? I still didn't hear you. I'm oh, sorry. How did you keep track of how many planes were shot down? We had a log book. The log book, every time you went on a flight, you put what plane you flew, the bureau number of the plane, uh, what you were going out, you were doing a fighter sweep, or you're going out to strafe, or you're going out to, to uh, escort bombers, and that flight log book kept track of everything, and I kept accurate track of it all. That's how I come to write my book. Was there ever competition between uh, pilots to get the most kills? Constantly competition. <laughs> the, the competition that went on when I was there was the one between Joe Floss who had shot down 26 Japanese airplanes over Guadalcanal and Pappy Boynton and uh, there was competition and in Europe the competition was even worse than that because they had more airplanes to shoot at. I just finished the book that told them about that competition. <clears throat> um, what does it take to become an ace? It takes five planes that have burnt and were witness and crashed at a certain place. Probable, one that smokes and doesn't burn. You can't count that as one of them. Bring you to the ace steps. Of course, as I told you, I shot down seven, but I was trained to do that. I I shot down a float plane, roof float plane. That was a Japanese plane. In an aerial combat, following Pappy up through a loop one time, he shot down a plane. 
and he flew through the own debris of it, and they all got over the front of his windshield, and he couldn't see out, so we had to go home. But I'm just lucky to be able to talk about these things. Well, who do you remember the most from your service? People I remember most, probably, was my squadron mates, Happy Boynton, Chris McGee, Don Moore, Jim Hill, Ed Harper, John Bolt, our double ace. Wow. Um, how was Pappy Boynton as a leader? Pappy Boynton as a leader was very aggressive. He believed in a job being done. He could care less for medals. He was sent over there to get the job done. Did he hate the Japanese? No. He only hated what they did. Mm -hmm. And he was of the opinion they had a job to do, we had a job to do. Now it's the one who survives. And when and how was he captured? That was a story in itself, and I'm glad you asked this question. Four days before I was flying away on Pappy, and I wanted to be with him when we, he broke the record, which was 26 airplanes, 25 airplanes. And I was going to the Johnny at night. I had dysentery, and I was going to the Johnny at night. I tripped over a tent rope, fell, and sprained my wrist. Well, when I sprained my wrist, they x-rayed it. They x-rayed it with what x-ray machines they had over there. He said, you might have cracked it, but you didn't didn't break it, but you can't fly anymore with that kind of a setup because you are a detriment to the squadron. If you can't activate holding the stick back, pushing the throttle forward and do this or that, you might run into your own men. On that particular day, <coughs> Captain Mashin is right there. He had reoccurring malaria. And he was supposed to, we get up at 3.30 in the morning, he was supposed to take the flight with Pappy. But he had reoccurring malaria, so we threw blankets over him, and I went down and told somebody to put my name up on the board, take his name down. But as I got in my airplane to take off, the doctor got wind of this, the flight surgeon, and he pulled in front of the Corsair and wouldn't move. I had to get out, stop the airplane, get out of the airplane. And uh, then they went to Bougainville, gassed up, and Captain Mashin was able to catch them in Bougainville, and he became Pappy's wingman that day. They went over in a fighter sweep to Rabal. They were 20,000 feet, and Babby decided there's nothing to shoot at, so he's going to go below the cirrus clouds, which was down around 10 or 12,000 feet. He went down with George Ashman. As they got below the clouds, eight Japanese fighter planes jumped them. They, Ashman shot down one, Babby shot down a couple, and as Ashman as Pappy looked at Ashman, Ashman was heading straight down. Not straight down, but in a gentle glide. And he yelled to him, <coughs> roll over, split S, get out of there. He evidently had been killed in his own airplane. So that was the end of Ashman. Then they shot Pappy down. They blew up his dashboard with 30 millimeters. He rolled over, and as he bailed out of his airplane, his leg hit the horizontal, no, the vertical stabilizer. He broke his leg. Well, he hit the water just as the chute opened. He pulled his May West. It was full of holes. So that wouldn't keep him up. So what he had to do was get a hold of that life raft, which was encased below, or just below, above the parachute. So he was able to get into his life raft 
he floated around for quite a while and he saw this chap sub come. He saw this sub come and he thought it was one of ours. Well, it was a Japanese sub. They picked him up and they took him to Rabal. They kept him there at Rabal. Finally, they took him to truck. As he landed on truck, the Navy, this is later on, of course, the Navy hit them with 500 pound bombs. He said, well, I'm not going to get killed by the Japs. I'm going to get killed by our own people. He didn't get killed. There was an intelligence officer. His name was Honda, just like the Honda car. said, we've got to get back to the mainland, to Japan. Because he knew MacArthur was bypassing these islands. And those people were starving. The Japs were starving. The thing ended up, they took him to truck. He worked for the lady in the kitchen. And got to be very familiar with her. She's a real old lady. And he had taken handfuls of lard and eaten it. said it just tastes like honey. That's how starved they were. Pappy made it back to the mainland of Japan. Harold Stassen, who was the runner for presidency, found out it was written in flower on the roof, Pappy is here. So he went in, he told the Japanese colonel that was in there that was running the camp, he said, I want to take Pappy out of here. The colonel said, you can't. He said, you better go out the door and look, see what's happened. He didn't know that we had gone as far as we had. That's the last he saw the colonel. Pappy was brought back to Hawaii and brought back to the States. Did he tell you any stories about when he was in the prisons? Oh yeah, there were stories. There was a guy named a guy named Holloran. Holloran was the one that gave Pappy's eulogy at the Arlington Cemetery. He was a B-29 pilot, and of course he got shot down, and he and Pappy got close together. You can't fool with the Japanese, because if you don't cooperate a little bit with them, they're going to eliminate you. They had one Lieutenant J.G. You know, Lieutenant J.G. said, I'm only going to tell them my name, rank, and serial number. Pappy said, you can't do that. They'll kill you. Two days later, they killed him. And how, do you know how long Pappy was held prisoner for? How long he was a prisoner? 16 months. Wow. Um, now, did you perform any unusual services or duties while in the Black Sheep Squadron? Uh, yeah, I kept them with fresh fish. <laughs> I, uh, I took care of Pappy's pocketbook when he got in wrestling matches. <laughs> he loved to wrestle. And he got a little bit of sauce. He'd wrestle anybody. And he'd come up to Joe Foss one day. Joe Foss is six foot three, and he says, Pappy, he said to him, Pappy said to Joe Foss, we've never had a wrestling match, have we? Joe Foss says, yeah, we're not gonna, going to have one. Pappy went over and put a lock on him. Joe Foss threw him in the corner. Pappy said, I guess that's the end of that. <laughs> um, I see in your book that you took leave. Where did you go for that? Sydney, Australia. And what did you do while you were there? Sydney, Australia was paradise. We had never seen any females since we left. Well, we saw females, but they had they had black teeth, <laughs> fiery red hair, and they weren't the right thing to attract you. <laughs> but we went to Australia six weeks, and we come back. No, we went to Australia for eight days. We were six weeks up the line, then went back to Australia again for six weeks. We did that two times with eight days in between. But we did not go to Australia, I'm correcting myself, we did not go to Australia for six weeks, we went for eight days. Um, what experiences in your service left the greatest impression on you? Well, when I come out of the service, I was supposed to go over again on carriers. Mm -hmm. I went to the West Coast, and my mother <coughs> my mother was home, 
my sister was a Lieutenant J.G. in the Navy. And I decided I wanted to go home to Mom. Because she was a school teacher and followed me all across the Pacific. By the letters I wrote to her, if I was in the New Hebrides, I'd write to Mrs. N.H. McClure. She'd get out her map, geography teacher. He's in the New Hebrides. And that's the way she traced me across the Pacific. Oh, because it had to be kept secret where right. you were? That's... Um, where were you when the atomic bombs were dropped in Japan? I'll tell you, I met the man. I was back stateside. I came back and trained fighter pilots to go over. I was in Marine Air Infantry School. I was in an engineering officer school. I was in a rocket school. And then I was sent back to Miramar in California. And I was due to go out in a carrier then. And what was the hardest part about being a fighter pilot to you? The hardest part about being a fighter pilot to me was getting lost over that big Pacific. <laughs> That's a lot of water out there. And I got lost twice. But by the grace of God, I did my training well. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. I always know where I started for. Next one was eight minutes. And I came to the conclusion, I don't care what it is, if there's a light out there, I'm going to land on it. Found out it was my own strip. <laughs> That's lucky. Um, were you ever injured during the war or become sick? I'll say that again, please. Were you ever injured or come, no. come sick, become sick? Never injured. Well, I hit my head in the gun sight when I landed with that flat tire. And uh, you don't get purple hearts for self-inflicted things. <laughs> Um, did you receive any medals or decorations? Yes, I was in the, when Babby came to the West Coast, or he, he was, he was celebrated by the Life magazine. We got a picture of that. There were nine of our boys out there. Then he came to the East Coast and Harry Truman gave him the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, Harry Truman kept him waiting 45 minutes and Babby wasn't too happy about that. He had other things to do. When he came out, Harry Truman told him, I'm very sorry, I kept you waiting. He said, I'd sure like to be you, Pappy. Pappy looked at Truman and he said, I'd rather be you. <laughs> um, after the war was over, did you keep in touch with Pappy and your other? Yeah, we passion? sold war bonds together. We sold war bonds together. He came to visit me with his fourth wife which was a peach. He was a cured al alcoholic. They lived in Fresno, California. They came and visited us for four days. He gave speeches and we visited the 174th Fighter Boys in uh, um, Hancock Airfield. And we also visited the Tank Corps. Um, now, beyond all the Hollywood drama that was added, do you think that the movie and television show had accurate information in it about the, the Well, I'll tell you about that. I was invited to go by Major Chapman, who was Gladys Swarth's husband. She was a noted opera singer. I was invited to go to Washington, D.C. to be interviewed and appear on Milton Berle's program, Let Yourself Go. On that program was Earl Flynn. Earl Flynn was the most handsome guy you've ever seen. And of course he had a million women chasing him around. So I met Earl Flynn and I appeared on the program. And the main question was, what would be your secret ambition? I said to give my mother a trip to California to see my brother who was working for Boeing Aircraft at the time. They said, well, we're giving you a check to do that. Oh, wow. So I appeared on that program, and it was marvelous. I went, to a, I went to a party on the East River, because Major Chapman said, you can stay over. I said, I have a girlfriend that I knew that lived in New York City in Larchmont. I'd like to bring her. She said, bring her. Of course, she was a stunning girl. 
Of course, I never married her. She never married me. So anyway, uh, we went to that cocktail party and I met a lot of opera singers. And they were very down-to-earth people. I come out of the service, came home, became a manufacturer's rep, selling plumbing and heating to the wholesalers of plumbing and heating. I also see that you were on the History Channel. What was that experience like? Yeah, I've, I've appeared on, I'm not bragging, it's just nice to be recognized. I appeared on that in many programs and was separately interviewed. And there were other black sheep that were on that program too. Um, how did all of your experiences as a fighter pilot affect your life? It's affected my life because I'm still living the war. I'm still selling the book. <laughs> Does it get to be rough sometimes? Yeah, you'll wonder how much longer you're going to hold on playing war. But that's part of history. That makes me feel a little better. I'm not just bragging about what our squadron did. I'm bragging about the fact that you people are recognizing history. And this should be taught to our kids. The sacrifices that have been made. It's like Tom Brokaw said, the greatest generation. We were the greatest generation because there was no other way around. And we were pleased to be part of the greatest generation. Um, what exact medals and decorations did you receive? Say that again, please. What exact medals and decorations did you receive? I received, and I gave somebody that little piece of paper there that has it all on there. Oh, yeah, not there. We'll off had, the top of your head. All right, I, I received five distinguished flying crosses, eight air medals, two presidential unit citations. No squadron has ever been issued two presidential citations, and our squadron was. Did you have any Medal of Honor winners in your squadron? Uh, no, Pappy was the only one, and he got it posthumously, and then when they found he was a prisoner of war, they gave it to him again. Wow. His first wife got rid of the first <laughs> one by selling it. <laughs> I'm sure he was happy about that. Yeah. Um, did, did you join any organizations after you retired from the military? Oh, I become um, I belong to the American Legion, and uh, I belong to many sales organizations, and uh, I traveled all of New York State except the metropolitan area of New York City. Do you have any other war stories that you'd like to tell us? Before. The only other war story that I could remember that I'd like to tell, it had to do with Jim Hill. Jim Hill's compass wasn't working, and his wingman, he was headed out of the battle in Rabal. He was headed the wrong way home. He would have flown out to sea, and that would have been the end of him. But Al Johnson saw where he was going, got next to him, told him he's going the wrong way. See, Jim Hill's compass wasn't working. Al's was. And Al brought Jim Hill back. It seemed like the compasses stopped working a lot, a lot. How could you tell if your compass wasn't working? Well, if your compass isn't working and you were alone, you would never know which direction to go once you've been in the fighter suite. Mm -hmm. I had. I had an engine cut out on me, and I think that was the day I decided somebody else was going in the water beside me. That's when I shot down two Japs. And it was pretty simple because I'm coming up from behind. So I don't think they were the brightest boys. But they could, they could outmaneuver you, and they shot a lot of us down. Are there any words of wisdom you would like to leave us with? One more time. Are there any words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with? Yes. <laughs> There's one word of wisdom. L-O-V-E. If we all loved one another, there would be no wars. No one should ever die in a war. That's why I'm against Iraq. 
I'm against any killings that go on. Yes, you did it. I was a victim of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Love is the most important thing today. Whether it be man and woman, man to man, woman to woman. Love. If we loved one another like God taught us, we wouldn't have wars. But that's never to be. Well, thank you so much for your time, Lieutenant Colonel. My, I really appreciate that. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now, if you can take a picture of...